tak teď by to mělo nahrávat. Jo, ano. Mm-hmm. Very good. So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So, it is a great pleasure to introduce Juzy Mazone. So, let me just give a little, little bit of introduce her. So, so, she did her study, let's say, in, in University of Bari in Italy. Then she did PhD in uh, University del Salento in Lecce. And after that, she moved to Pittsburgh and she did, so she has two PhD, let's say one in, in, in Italy. And then second PhD she did with uh, Professor Galdi about this motion of rigid body, which containing a uh, cavity uh, entirely filled by a viscous liquid. And after finishing her PhD, she moved first, uh, she was first in Pittsburgh, then in, in Nashville. And nowadays she's in Queens University in Kingston in, in Canada. And today she will, um, she will present her work on partially dissipative system. So please. Thank you, thank you, Sharka. Thank you very much for the introduction and the kind invitation, as well as the other organizers. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, meet you virtually, but to meet you uh, today. So yeah, my talk is about uh, this partial dissipative system. This will be the main theme, uh, even though then later we will see that we will talk really about the fluid solid interaction. So what is a partially dissipative system? Uh, so we consider a systems of partial differential equations or partial differential equations in ordinary differential equations. And uh, basically these are systems that uh, are characterized by having various variables and some of them var decay in time, while some others either keep constant or depending on the problem can be even excited during the motion. So let me be a little bit more precise uh, and I'll do it in this abstract uh, form then we will see later on so we will do the specific application. So let us consider this ODE. This is an ODE and assume that is an ODE in a Banach space, which means that your initial data or your unknown U is a function that at every time belongs to the Banach space X. So if X was Rn, this was just a system of ODEs. If X is an Ilebeck space or suburb space, then this will be a, a partial system of partial differential equations. So the structure of the system is such that we can identify a linear part and a nonlinear part. I will be very general on this, but what is the characteristic of this is that this variable U, this unknown U, is characterized by two variables for which we have the, the following two energy balance. Equation P one or condition P1 is what you would usually have by just doing a classical energy estimates. And this would be for physical problems, would be basically balance of a kinetic energy. Whereas the second equation is more a kind of, you think about it like, like a constraint that you put on the equation because of some interaction in our particular application because of the interaction with uh, some uh, solid body. But these are the only two required requirements, <clears throat> sorry, these are only the only two requirements that I put on my system of equation. So why these are interesting from the mathematical point of view? Because basically P1, let's say what I will usually call like natural energy, if you look at it, sorry, I go back, you know, in general, even this one will not give us existence of global in time solution if I don't have any control of the variable A. On the other side, P2 puts a, a, put a kind of constraint, as I already said, on the, on the equation. And so basically this one would give us information or would make the, for example, the sets of equilibria uh, much more complicated. In general, we have, you know, we have a manifold of equilibria. And so if we want to take P1 and P2 together, it's not even that clear, even if we have a global solution, whether we can say anything about the long time behavior or um, the stability of the system. So this will be the main theme of my talk. And I will, um, 
I will try to specialize that uh, evolution equation that ODE in the Banach space for certain kind of equation arising in fluid solid interaction. But in fact, one can think about this uh, even to more general problems. So not only interaction between fluid and rigid bodies, but also interaction with the fluids and elastic bodies. So this is why you can have in this partially distributive system, you don't only not only have a coupling of PD and ODE, but you can have a more generally parabolic, hyperbolic uh, kind of partial differential equation. The same kind of features or, or, uh, or behavior is observed only also in the, this kind of interaction. But for the sake of this talk, I will um, uh, focus on the uh, first kind of interactions. So let me uh, give you the first application. The first application is the following. Consider a rigid body, B1 is this outer rigid body, and assume that it has a cavity of arbitrary shape, which is completely filled by a fluid. And now assume that immersed in this fluid, there is an homogeneous rigid ball. And now what we are interested in because of the application that you will see in the next slides are what are called the free rotation of the whole system. So what we are thinking here is that we assume that the center of the mass of the system is a fixed point. And so what we are doing, we give an initial rotation to the system. Here I just make a picture. They say we have an initial rotation of the interior ball and an initial rotation of the outer ball. This is just a picture. And then we let it go and see what happens. So this is the kind of the problem. Just to a disclaimer here, I'm not considering translations. So I'm just considering rotations, OK? Um, so what are, why do I consider rotations? From the mathematical point of view, this is, of course, uh, uh, removing the problem of the collision is, uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, mathematical simplifications. Uh, but what I'm mainly interested in is because of the application, and this is, uh, sorry, uh, the application, let me do, go to the application, then I go back to the equations, because of geophysics. Uh, so it is well known that uh, the earth in a core uh, spins around this center at its own rate. And the, uh, the, the fluid uh, uh, core, so the, basically the area between the, the mantle and the crust and the inner core is filled by liquid iron. And the motion within the inner core is what is thought to be the driving mechanism for the geodynam, the degeneration of the magnetic field of the Earth, as well as for the general motion of the Earth, and in particular for the precession and the rotation. Having this application in mind, in which from the geophysical point of view, the uh, um, uh, translation of the inner core are not considered. So in this sense, I'm just of, uh, giving a motivation of why I'm not considering um, uh, the uh, translation of the inner core, because my future, you know, and ongoing and future work will be basically trying to find a mathematical motivation of these uh, two phenomena. But now let's go to the equation. So these are the equation of motion. Um, so with U, is the Eulerian uh, absolute velocity of the fluid. V is uh, the relative velocity of the fluid uh, with respect to the rigid body. Uh, so basically, V, let me write uh, up here. So U, we write U as V plus omega 1 cross X, where uh, omega 1 is the angular velocity of the outer rigid body. And IB is, is inertial tensor. And the hypothesis that I put, which is simplifying, uh, this can be made it a little bit more general, but again, I want just to give the idea of how things work, is that the homogeneous ball, um, that, that the inner core is an homogeneous ball, so that is inertial tensor is a multiple of the identity. So the equation is similar to the equation of the outer body, the only difference that this IB is a, 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 a matrix, uh, and this is uh, 
uh, this lambda is because the corresponding initial tensor for the inner core is uh, a multiple of the identity. And the integral that you see at, uh, on the right hand side are respecti respectively for the outer here and for the inner core here, the total torque exerted by the fluid on the, on the solids. Uh, T here, we are talking about the viscous incompressible fluid. So T is the Cauchy stress tensor. And this is minus P identity plus uh, two mu, uh, the rate of deformation tensor. DV. The U is the basically symmetric part of the gradient. And so uh, to this equation, we append uh, non-slip boundary conditions. So basically we are imposing that uh, the fluid velocity is exactly the fluid of the, of the bodies at the boundary. And for this system, we are uh, looking at the uh, existence of weak solution, strong solution, and eventually this is still a kind of work in progress, the characterization of the long, long time behavior. So already told you about the application. So a little bit of literature. Um, so this, uh, this kind of uh, fluid uh, solid interaction have been looked at from a different perspective. If there is no inner core, as already Sharka has mentioned, this has been my uh, major uh, research work uh, during my uh, graduate studies. And it revolves around the Zukowski conjecture, which basically, you know, in few words, which is basically uh, says that the, the, the fluid has a stabilizing effect on the rigid body. Here there is no inner core. So basically what happens is at long times, this uh, fluid filled rigid body will move as it is a whole rigid body with constant angular velocity around one of the principal axes of inertia of the system. So basically there are no precessions, for example, at a very long time. And this is something that uh, we have proved in different uh, steps, but even more generally. Um, a little bit more uh, recently in a more general um, functional settings. Now, what happens when there are there is an inner core or there are mo even more than one uh, fluid, um, sorry, more than one solid within the fluid? This is a very, very well studied. Uh, when the outer solid is uh, prescribed because, okay, the main and uh, most interesting problem here is the problem of collision between uh, several rigid bodies within the liquid or one rigid body and, uh, um, and uh, the, uh, the, 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 let's say the container and the outer boundary. And there is a very long literature with, uh, you know, um, with many uh, contributions, some of them uh, by Sharka. This is just, uh, I'm just, uh, uh, you know, putting the case of incompressible and there is a whole word also for the, uh, incompress uh, for the compressible case, which uh, I, I just don't, uh, I apologize, but I, I don't uh, recall here. So now the point is that, okay, can we somehow try to uh, uh, extend the, what Zukowski has uh, conjecture and we proved for the case in which there is no inner core, when there is an inner core at least rotating around the fixed point and eventually, I mean, this will be eventually also think about the translation. So, uh, trying to reconnect to partial dissipative systems. So the two properties that I, I mentioned at the beginning for the abstract uh, um, evolution uh, equation are satisfied here. So one can show by a simple, you know, uh, formal uh, energy balance. So the usual technique of multiplying the equations by the velocity of the fluid, integrating by parts, and then taking care of the uh, boundary term through the equation of the fluid we can have this, uh, this is the balance of kinetic energy, which would also for sure if the, you could show existence of a regular solution. And to this, one can show also that uh, if you define uh, with A, which is uh, the total angular momentum of the system with respect to the center of the mass of the system, then um, in the, the in the moving frame, this is the frame that is attached to uh, the outer body. You know there is this uh, uh, this balance law, and one of the um, uh, 
consequence of this is that the magnitude of A is conserved at all times. So you can just uh, dot multiply uh, this equation by A and you see that uh, the derivative of the magnitude of A is constant. However, you see this equation and you see that, okay, in this case, we have the fluid velocity. This is absolute velocity of the fluid. And this recall that the, this is non-zero as two boundary values. Uh, one is the, you know, the rotation of the outer body and the inside the also you have the rotation of the um, uh, inner core. And then there is, uh, this is the kinetic energy of the outer body and this will be the corresponding kinetic energy of uh, the inner core. And you see a dissipation, which is just in terms of the rate of deformation tensor, um, basic symmetric part of the gradient of, of U. And that this form of the, of, of, the, of the equation, given the fact that U is uh, nowhere zero on the boundary, then it's not clear whether even this one is a kind of uh, dissipation in terms of you. But in fact, it is. Uh, one needs just to do a little bit of more work. And the, the, the idea is that, is that, okay, so we do believe that we should see this stabilizing effect. So we, basically the, 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 the trick, or no, it's not a trick, it's basically the hope, uh, is that, uh, you know, we want that as time goes to infinity, I hope that the whole system also with the inner core will behave as a whole rigid uh, body. So the idea is that, okay, let us introduce uh, this uh, angular velocity omega, which is a kind of relative now I will be really uh, naive, but this is a kind of ang relative angular velocity of the inner core relatively to the outer core. And then this field here, which if I want to give a physical explanation is a kind of, is, you know, if you, if you take these, uh, 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 you see that there is I minus one, this I is uh, the, uh, is written here, is uh, uh, the total inertial tensor. This is the inertial tensor of the outer body and this is inertial tensor of the inner core. So basically the idea is that I'm writing um, uh, the, uh, the, to the relative angular momentum of whatever is inside the cavity in the form of I omega R, okay? So uh, I hope that this is uh, somehow, um, uh, somehow uh, clear. But anyway, this is mathematically it's just a change of variables, but the future of this is that this true that makes an Navier-Stokes equation a little bit more complicated. T is the same, but we have additional terms which are uh, centrifugal and colloidal forces, of, but it allows us at least to get rid of one of, uh, of, of the ODEs and make it really like ODE. So basically get rid of the corresponding integral term and also the velocity becomes zero on one part of the boundary. So what if, if one wants to make sense of this system, what this, uh, how can we look at this system? And this is how in fact we do when we do the calculations. So basically, if you, if you combine everything together, these are, this formulation, this equivalent formulation, which is mathematical, I mean, it's really mathematical, these variables that I'm introducing here, I try to give you an explanation, but this is really a change of variables. But what this system does is that allow us to look at the physical problem in this equivalent formulation in which then we can, once we write down the weak formulation, it will be basically the weak formulation of, let me make a picture here, of a fluid field rigid body, so here there is the rigid body B, but now this fluid here is like a fluid with varying viscosity or varying uh, uh, density. In fact, what varies is the density, which varies is just piecewise constant, okay? And this kind of, uh, um, you know, formulation with, the, you know, the corresponding uh, weak formulation allow us uh, up to some, uh, you know, technicalities to somehow use the standard Galerkin method, but now for uh, 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 homogeneous fluids to the proof for the proof of the um, of the existence of weak solution. And in fact, um, 
for the existence of weak solution. And in fact, the, the energy balance works out well because as we rewrite our equation and we redo our testing, we see that our energy balance reads as follows, in which we do have a quantity here, which uh, the, the energy balance does not give any dissipation for, but all these terms here is uh, the energy which is uh, well dissipated by our uh, uh, rate of deformation tensor here. On the other side, this is the property P2, remember the constraint on the equation is that now with this uh, new constant omega, I'm sorry, new variables omega one minus omega r, the uh, balance of linear momentum is, is written in the, this form here, okay? But however, these two uh, now uh, balances together with, as I said, uh, a little bit of work because now, you know, we are considering fluid with the varying density. And so we also want to retrieve back our uh, uh, variables, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the physical uh, velocities. So then we also need, you know, when we exploited the Galerkin method, we also needed to do projection in a more regular basis that we would do uh, usually for just the weak solutions uh, to the fluid equation. Nevertheless, with a little bit of work, uh, one can show the following uh, results. That, that for any initial data, this is in the classical uh, space uh, for fluids. And uh, um, angular velocity, of course, they should satisfy some uh, compatibility condition. Then there exists at least one weak solution. By one weak solution, I mean the classical for V, for the velocity is the classical space that is the classical array of class. Uh, satisfying the energy inequality, but of course the, the, uh, uh, the weak uh, form, um, the strong energy inequality is called the strong energy inequality. The initial data are attained in uh, this uh, sense and the equations are satisfied in the uh, distributional sense. And in addition, one can show that just for weak solution, no conditions on the initial data or other conditions on the geometry, then one can show that the velocity of the fluid goes to zero in R2 and omega, remember that omega is the angular velocity of uh, uh, the relative angular velocity between the two solids, also that one goes to zero. And in fact, we do have, um, um, rate of decay uh, in case in which also basically the outer body is, uh, is a, it has a spherical symmetry, which is not necessarily geometrical. If you remember IB, which is just the inertial tensor of the outer body, that is also in the case in which that is also a multiple of the identity. But anyway, in the general case, even without rate, we do have this form of decay. And this solution enjoys also other properties. Uh, one of those is a, a, a weak strong uniqueness principle. And this is uh, in the style of uh, in the seven in the seven kind of type uh, uh, weak strong uniqueness principle, which basically says, okay, if you have one weak solution and you have another solution which is in LP or Q, LP in time or Q in space, P and Q satisfying the settings condition, then you have. Um, uh, uniqueness corresponding to the same initial data, then you have uniqueness. And on top of this, and here I, I didn't put the details because this, this uh, second property um, goes a little bit beyond the theme of, of, this, of this talk is the existence of strong solutions in the very general LP, LQ maximal regularity for also time weighted spaces. And uh, again, this is, uh, uh, this is a further result, but it goes a little bit, uh, you know, uh, away from the theme of this talk. So, and then the natural question would be, what about the stability? Uh, that is uh, still uh, something that uh, is a work in progress, but I want to, you know, give you just a flavor of what our thing work and the, 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 the flavor, and this is also what I, I like to do with my students, is to do it in a very, very simple case, uh, which is in fact the one work that we have been doing last summer with one of our undergraduate students, which is basically look at the 
a lumped parameter model. So what is the, 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 the problem here? So is the same setting as before, but now we assume that the gap, this, this green gap here between the light green gap between the two bodies is so thin uh, so that basically you can think about it you know, the way that these, these problems, these problems particularly arise are in lubrication problems. So basically you think about a very, very thin layer of a fluid, and then they assume this is more engineering uh, assumption that uh, the, the thickness is so small so that the interaction of the fluid is through a viscous force of the form, you know, this linear form, K omega one minus omega. Now these are capital omegas, but the meaning is the same. Capital omega is the uh, angular velocity of B and capital omega one would be the angular velocity of the inner core. So now in this simplified project, uh, project problem, um, the, the, the partial differential equation go away. Uh, this becomes a system of ODEs. Um, these uh, uh, damping parameters here depends on viscosity of the fluid. And uh, this was a, a original problem proposed by Laurentiev as a you know, a toy problem for the uh, problem of a, a, flu a, a rigid body with a, a, um, a cavity with a fluid. Anyway, this is just an ODE. This was a, a, a you know an undergraduate research project. So what is uh, what is the idea? Also for this problem, we have the corresponding energy balance and conservation of the magnitude of the total angular momentum. It's just easier for this problem to characterize what are the equilibria. Equilibria of the system are basically only. Uh, the only rotation would be the ones for which, sorry, this omega one is capital omega one. There is, this is capital omega one. So the 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 the, uh, the equilibria are just the ones for which the two rigid bodies uh, rotate with the same angular velocity, and the angular the, this constant angular velocity is an eigenvector of the inertial tensor of the outer body. Okay, so we is a, is a this can be done also in the corresponding infinitely dimensional cases. It's just easier to prove, uh, for sure, for an undergraduate student. But what was a more, um, uh, you know, interesting at least from uh, the point of view of. Uh, being an undergraduate project is that one could show that uh, we just by a qualitative analysis of the ODE, one could show that as time goes to infinity, the two angular velocity are going to be the same and that the, actually with the derivative going to zero. And so basically what these two results tell us that, uh, you know, the trajectory they are going to approach the manifold of equilibrium. And these are, you know, these are manifold because as you see in the previous case, I told you that the constant angular velocity is in the eigenspace of J. And now depending on the eigenvalues, we can have a one dimensional, two dimensional, full three dimensional um, uh, set of equilibrium. And then how do we show convergence? What, what do, okay, First, what do we show? We show that each trajectory, no matter the initial data, converge to a permanent rotation, permanent rotation and just a uh, rotation with constant angular velocity about the principal axis of inertia of J. And this is somehow hinted in the previous two results, but what is striking is that we have exponential rate to the equilibrium. And so how this is proved? So the, the first two results is they are crucial because they tell, tell us where trajectory go. Then the convergence to the equilibrium, the fact that actually we are not, you know, these trajectories could be pretty much be wandering around the sets of equilibria. The fact that we actually, the, the trajectory actually converge to a point of the equilibria is done through a, a linearization principle, which is not the usual one that we teach to uh, second year, uh, at least I teach to second year or the in, in second year or the class, but is kind of the uh, 
finite dimensional version of the principle of linearized stability introduced by uh, Prince Simonetta and Zakia in 2009, uh, for which we did find a corresponding, uh, you know, um, at least for a similar problem, we find the corresponding statement in the finite dimensional case with some other students, but then we found actually more general statement in this OD book by Prus and, and Wilke. And so as I said, the, 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 really the, the, the two ingredients are one, knowing where trajectory go and the fact that trajectory are converging to the set of equilibria and to the linearization principle, which now what is the difference with the classical one is the fact that uh, this system do have a slow center manifold. In other words, uh, zero is in the, uh, in the spectrum. So uh, we need a little bit more work uh, to uh, show the exponential, not only the, the, the fact that, uh, you know, linear stability implies non-linear stability, but also uh, the, uh, the exponential rate for the decay. So again, this is the OD uh, part, but this somehow gives you the flavor how it would uh, work uh, um, for the corresponding uh, um, Infinite dimensional case, of course, uh, the price that we have to pay is that we are in the infinite dimensional case. And so we have, uh, you know, uh, even proving uh, certain properties of, of uh, the trajectories is no longer trivial, uh, you know, not only, you know, it's not as easy as this uh, undergraduate project. So, um, this is about uh, this is what is about uh, the uh, this kind of uh, rigid body rigid body fluid interactions. Uh, now I want to introduce another partial dissipative system, which also goes away um, from the stability, somehow goes away from the stability because it's more uh, related to time periodic uh, problems. So what is the physical problem? Assume that you have an infinite channel, an infinite channel, take it as a cylinder um, of arbitrary shaped uh, Cross section. The only, really, the only um, hypothesis that you need is that uh, at the entry, at the at the exit, so very far from uh, the this body his, this body his, the cross section must be constant. Okay, so we want maybe different, but it has to be constant. You know, after a certain distance away, and we assume that within this fluid is immersed a, a harmonic oscillator, a linear harmonic oscillator. So basically, a spring with the stiffness constant k attached to a mass m, and we assume that one end of the spring is fixed. We disregard uh, the uh, any gravitational force, so that we are just interested in the oscillation of the uh, mass spring system along uh, the axis of uh, the symmetry axis of uh, the channel. And so, what is the problem? What is the driving mechanism? We assume that there is a prescribed time periodic flow rate applied to the fluid. So this is time periodic. So now the question is, does it exist a corresponding time periodic solution for the fluid and for uh, the body? This is you know, an interesting problem for the application that you will see. But from a mathematical point of view, one of the questions that we ask is whether phenomena like resonance may appear because the and this will be clear also in the equation the fact that there is an applied flow rate a periodic time periodic with certain frequency uh, to the fluid it means that there is a time periodic force applied to the body and now the question is if this periodic force has a frequency equal to the natural frequency of the mass spring oscillator would we have resonance so or in other words, would we have periodic solution or we, we would have solutions which uh, 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 blow up with the magnitude of the oscillation becomes infinity. So this is, uh, the, uh, this is the problem. So let me give you the governing equation. So we write the equation uh, with a moving frame uh, with origin at the, basically at the point at the end of the spring. So I will put at the end of the spring, which is at equilibrium. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
frame with the axis E1, E2, and E3, where the special one is E1, which is along the symmetry axis of the, uh, of the channel, of the cylinder. So we call with gamma the boundary of the body and with the sigma, basically the uh, surface of the cylinder. Then the equation in this moving frame are again for the fluid is written here is another Stokes equation. Again, we are a viscous incompressible fluid. T is the, state, the same as the one before, the usual Cauchy stress tensor for a Newtonian fluid. Of course, you have a, a, a additional term here because of the moving frame. And since we are just looking about oscillation, so basically the displacement, displacement of the body would be just of the form ZT. E1, where ZT is an unknown and satisfies this equation, um, the second order ODE, but uh, with this term on the right hand side, which is the total force exerted by the fluid on the, uh, on the body. And then we prescribe uh, the, flow, the, fla the flow rate, the flux, with this uh, phi. And this phi will be given as periodic. And then uh, no slip boundary condition on the boundary, and of course zero velocity on the on on the particular zero velocity on the on the on the channel, and of course uh, periodic condition. So now you can see from here what I was saying before, because of this flow rate, which we assume to be periodic, there will be we expect to be a periodic. Uh, uh, corresponding velocity field. And now this would be the force which may be periodic or should be periodic. And now if this is periodic, what if now this has frequency, which uh, is uh, the square root of K over M, which is the natural frequency uh, for a, an harmonic oscillator. So applications. Uh, so the applications that uh, we have in mind are uh, bas basically for energy harvesting, because at least uh, according to uh, this uh, company, uh, resonance, and by resonance, I mean the lack of periodic solutions. And so basically oscillation, which increase with magnitude that increase with time can or may be used for energy harvesting. Uh, so basically for renewable energy, and uh, these are just uh, uh, some of uh, the examples. So now the question is that does it happen or no? That we have or we don't have periodic solutions. So a little bit of literature. Uh, this problem uh, without the, the oscillator, the, the, the problem of a fluid in a channel is a long-standing problem and is related with the so-called Lyrae problem. So basically you have a Newtonian fluid in a channel, not necessarily as you see from here, you have a reservoir here connected to um, Two channel, as you see, these are not uh, is not necessarily a cylinder. So the reposes this problem on whether there exists a solution which, at large distances from the reservoir, converges to the Poisson flow, which is basically the the, the flow which is along uh, fully developed in the um, along the the the, uh, the uh, symmetry axis of the exits. So for the steady state problem, uh, the Lyrae problem is not completely solved yet. Amic uh, proved that uh, such a flow exists, provided that the flow rate is small. Uh, uh, at the same time, Ladizenska and Solonikov proved that, okay, we can remove, I mean, they could remove the assumption on the smallness of the flow rate. So prove the existence of a steady uh, state solution. However, though the solution, so without condition on the smallness on the flow rate, however, though the solution does have some decay at the exits, uh, however, they could not show that uh, the, so their solution would converge to the corresponding Poisson flow. Uh, 
Correspondingly, in the periodic case, again, no oscillator, Berau da Vega in 2005, uh, give basically the corresponding amic problem by showing that there exists a solution to the time periodic problem, which converges to uh, the corresponding time periodic generalization of the Poisson flow at, uh, uh, at infinity. Well, at infinity, of course, here I'm, I'm thinking space. So uh, let me tell you what is this uh, generalized uh, uh, Poisset flow, because it's not we, what we will uh, use, in fact. So the generalized uh, uh, T-periodic Poisset flow introduced by uh, Berau da Vega is a solution to basically the Nader Stokes equations um, with the uh, um, zero boundary condition periodic. Uh, uh, which have this uh, particular form. So they are uh, fully developed. So they have the only non-zero component is in the E1 direction with now time dependent uh, uh, component, but does not depend on the corresponding uh, variable X1. X1 is the variable component, uh, uh, the space component corresponding to E1, and we uh, prescribe now time periodic uh, flux uh, phi. So uh, this, this is the generalized uh, time periodic Poisson flow that Berau da Vega uh, used and shows that basically correspondingly there is a solution that uh, so now if I, uh, I go back, so then there is a solution that at large distance uh, will converge to chi, um, to, the, the, to, the, to the field chi that I have just uh, introduced. So the way that it goes, and this is also the, the, the similar idea that we will use, is basically to reduce the problem. Remember that this is a problem with non-zero flux because we also have also for our, uh, so the whole problem is what happens in the reservoir for the Rauda Vega. For us, it's what happens around the, ma the mass spring oscillator. So basically this is the, 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 the main difficulty besides also showing the decay at infinity. So the idea is to subtract what is called a flux carrier. So subtract a uh, fluid, um, um, a vector field V with a certain uh, suitable regularity problems, uh, regularity properties, sorry, which is time periodic divergence V zero everywhere on the boundary and such that a large distance in our case, this X1 is kind of a measure of being far enough from the oscillator. So remember that we have our problem here. So this is our problem. Um, the construction follows Berau da Vega, but Berau da Vega is without the mass spring oscillator. We have our mass and we have our spring fixed at one hand. So basically the whole point, this X1 is a distance from uh, the, uh, uh, that we can find uh, that uh, somehow uh, cuts our our uh, channel so that uh, we are sure that the, the mass spring oscillator is confined in what is called omega zero. So omega zero will be this uh, truncated uh, channel containing uh, the mass spring oscillator. So in this uh, outside this uh, this outside uh, this uh, truncated channel, this uh, flux carrier will be exactly the uh, generalized Poisson flow. And then the idea is that, okay, we have our equation and we rewrite our equation by, so U was uh, the, uh, the velocity of the fluid, then we write it by V minus this ca flux carrier capital B. And if we do this change of variables, then the equation becomes the following. Again, when you do change of variables, uh, the price that we pay the equations become more complicated and I will uh, explain uh, better in a second. But what is very important is that now our flux becomes zero. Okay, so how the equation become more complicated? Um, 
the, the T is not really complication. T, you know, has the same T is uh, your Cauchy stress tensor plus uh, the pressure term that you would get from uh, uh, the generalized T periodic Poisson uh, uh, flow. That you would, this is exactly the pressure Q is the pressure that you would get from the work of Verauda Vega. Of course, when you do the, you are subtracting the capital V, there are what I will call some forcing term appearing, which, uh, you know, depends only on the flux carrier and the corresponding pressure for the um, time periodic uh, uh, Poisset flow. And uh, so this, uh, this will be the equation, the corresponding equation. So um, we look at uh, time periodic quick solutions corresponding to a time periodic flux would be basically solution uh, which are in this space here. This in, in space, uh, basically this will be the usual completion of uh, this is the blue space here in the L2 and W12 norm. Please note that uh, the velocity is not zero everywhere on the boundary, but on the, on the solids we do always have the, the velocity non-zero. And so basically what you are doing here, how do you read this, uh, this equation here? This is basically by testing your function. This will be the usual distribution of solutions, but now your test functions are, are of the form eta times psi, where eta is just a function of time and psi is just a function of space. So there will be this particular form of, the, of the, the, the test function. However, one can show that if one could prove that weak solution are regular, so if one could show further regularity, then uh, one uh, would, prove, would find also strong solutions. So one could recover the, the usual, uh, the, the solution almost everywhere of the equations that I showed you before. Okay, so uh, this is the theorem. The theorem is that for any period T, but and any sufficiently small, uh, and you will see in the next slide by what I mean by sufficiently small. So the, the basically the W one two T. This W T is a reminder that our uh, fields are time periodic with period T uh, in subpolar space W one two. So this norm will be small. But any frequency, so any t, but small in the norm W1t, then there exists at least one weak solution. Okay, so the proof is not actually a standard, or I, 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 I say, <laughs> I only disagree. So it's not the standard proof that we would do for periodic solutions to, um, uh, to the fluids of the Navier-Stokes equation, because it goes to, you know, uh, a linearization principle, then a fixed point argument. So, so let me try to explain, um, explain a little what, uh, what's going on here. So basically, remember that we have, so let me, redo my channel here. So again, my uh, mass spring oscillator. And I remember that I had a truncated domain, which I called omega zero. Now, after this omega zero, we define omega m, which basically will be, so now this will be a kind of invading domains within the, the channel defining this form here. Sorry, let me take a point, this form here. Okay, so remember when m is equal to zero, you had that truncated domain omega zero, for which we told you that I can show that there exists, we can fix it so that we are sure that uh, that omega zero contains the mass spring oscillator. And then you define the omega m by making it uh, one unit uh, uh, bigger at each step. So now for each fixed m, we find vm z m, uh, the solution to the equation through a Galerkin approximation. So how the Galerkin approximation works. For each Galerkin approximation now, omega mn, so n will be the corresponding uh, Galerkin approximation at step m uh, in your uh, general approximation uh, scheme. So then you really linearize the problem by linearizing uh, basically the nonlinear term. So by introducing this kind of linearization. And then one shows the existence of periodic problem to the corresponding linear equation. Again, this would be the linear, is the linear, the linear term. And now you use a fixed point 
to find a Galerkin uh, solution, to, to find the, the, the Galerkin periodic solution to the nonlinear problem. But here we are still at the Galerkin level N. Then you uh, 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 use energy estimates to pass to the limit in N and hope that similar energy estimates would hold also at M level so that you then you can pass to the limit also over M. And what you need for making everything work and where the you know, smallness of the, the, the flux comes into play is basically the fact that you need bounds which are independent on M. We were not able to, or as of now, we are not able to prove that at the M level, the bounds are independent of M so that then uh, um, we can pass to the limit. So, so the all points, what, the, all, what I want to take you here is that uh, probably as most of the time in, in PDE, we have to be lucky with the energy estimate. Okay, so for sure, remember that our equations have some this forcing term coming because we are subtracting the flux carrier and plus, uh, you know, the, the usual now estimates that we have to do because the problem is eventually nonlinear. So good estimates. The good estimates are the one coming because of the construction of the flux carrier. In particular, we have that our forcing term, this is what is really important, our F, which will be for the fluid, has support which is contained in omega zero. So basically, far from the body, F will be zero. Um, we do have, uh, you know, these are the estimates which uh, eventually will give us uh, the, uh, the smallness of the flux, the condition on the smallness of the flux. Then there are these uh, two estimates which actually they are not needed for the, the existence of weak solutions. However, I put them here because we can get it with some work, but we can get it and they can be used to eventually prove existence of strong solution. So which I will not talk about it, but we can also show existence of strong solution exactly thanks to also this estimate. But what is important is this also uh, uh, estimate for the, uh, this nonlinear term. Okay, and please keep in mind that what is important is also this beta I1, it is exactly the trace of psi on the, on the mass of the mass spring oscillator. So these are the good estimates. Then what happens then if, as usual, try to do the uh, energy estimate, the, 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 the standard energy estimate will give you an equation of this form, an estimate, sorry, not an estimate, a balance of this form. This is at the level of Galerkin, okay? So everything is at the level of Galerkin. I'm just dropping the uh, M and N. Now, the problem is that uh, we have this term to work with because we have to somehow absorb if we want to, to show existence. You see now that this is like the P1 that I started with. And now we have these uh, terms here, which we somehow need to absorb or estimate. So some of, uh, of the estimates go uh, uh, pretty nice uh, because of the trace uh, uh, inequality and because of the previous property, the last uh, nonlinear estimates that I showed you, which is very similar to this, we can show that basically if the, 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 the flux is small enough, then we can absorb also uh, the, the, the term in, in, in V into dV into, into the uh, uh, dissipation here. So eventually with a little bit of work, this is exactly P1. This is what you would get with the, what I call natural energy, just skin balance of kinetic energy. And you see that there is this energy here. This is in terms of V, dz, dt, and z. And however, dissipation is not in z. So still this is not enough if you need to close, we have good estimates on here, but still this dissipation is not enough if we want to find bound on Z. So for this, it's not as easy as the case of the, uh, as the, 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 the other problem that I, I showed you, we need to really work more. And so the idea is that uh, 
we were able to find what is a right multiplier, which uh, if you are interested, we can discuss a little bit later. So basically, it, the idea is that we construct a particular basis in which the whole Galerkin uh, uh, method uh, works. And then uh, the, the construction of the basis is such that one vector in the basis uh, plays a special role. And that is the right multiplier that we use in the equation. And with a lot of messy calculation, we are able to find another energy functional, which is equivalent to our energy, but gives just enough uh, dissipation for us to close uh, the estimate. All the other term can be, all the other term here, this is just a rough estimate, all the other term can be uh, basically uh, bounded because of also the uh, energy estimate in E. And one, one thing that one uh, should keep in mind is that the usual, uh, usual proof that we do for uh, periodic solutions, which is basically using uh, the, uh, do the existence of the initial value problem, and then find the ball in which the initial value problem, is, sorry, the, the initial, sorry, let me say it again. So the usual trick or of proving the existence of the solution, the periodic solution using the you know, existence of the initial value problem and then show that uh, the corresponding solution repeats itself a capital T time doesn't work here. And even these kind of estimates do not help for this kind of proof. And so this is why, this is what makes the all uh, proof a little bit more involved. And this is just for the proof of the, uh, the, the, the passing to the limit for the n Galerkin method. Then one has to do similar estimates though, but then also to pass to the m for the invading uh, domain in the channel. And I think that I'm done and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your very interesting talk. So now I am opening uh, discussion. So are there some questions, remarks? So please go ahead. Okay, so, okay, I will, I will start. So, so in the first part, what you explained us was like kind of um, work which you already did with Professor Galdi, but the, the differences was that you have like, uh, let's say two bodies, let's say, but uh, in, uh, and somehow if I understand well, what you got concerning the stability result that you got again, the same result like that in the, for the rest state, you are coming to this permanent rotation. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that is what is expected. Yeah. What is expected. So somehow, is expected. even without, uh, let's say, how many bodies, let's say you will put, so both rotations somehow you are coming to one of this. Uh, yeah, so basically the, the, the idea is that, I mean, assume that they were uh, rotated initially at, uh, you know, different magnitude of velocity, but the opposite direction, mm -hmm. then uh, the hope is to show that they eventually will rotate uh, with the some constant angular velocity uh, around the same direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the second problem, what you talk about, which was also very interesting, was um, a little bit uh, different. So you have, let's say, uh, somebody and then you have this so uh, this oscillator and now this oscillator is time periodic no and through this that you have time periodic it is um, uh, then you have this uh, let's say dynamic condition and so on so this because you have this time periodic of your oscillator so finally you are coming to time periodicity of your flow this is this is your no. flow. No, it's not like that. So basically, the, assume that the, 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 the uh, mass spring oscillator is at rest, okay? Uh -huh. Then what happens is the fluid, the flow rate of the fluid is a prescribed a periodic. So there is a, 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 a periodic flow rate applied to the fluid. So now as the, period, the, 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 the 
this periodic flow rate will exert a flow a force a periodic force on the fluid and then in, 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 in exchange there will be possibly a periodic force applied in case, which you can see from here a periodic force of the uh, uh, of the fluid on the body uh -huh. so simply and then you, the question, mm -hmm. yes. so simply you assume that your fluid is periodic uh, no, we don't. We assume just that the flow rate is periodic, and then the question is that does it exist a periodic flow for the fluid, and now uh, for the fluid and for the rigid body, because if there's uh, if there exists a periodic uh, uh, motion for the fluid, then this would be a periodic force for on the body, and then what happens then? Does it uh, uh, cause resonance? Yeah, I was thinking if you don't need also, let's say, some periodic force, which is acting also on your form. Yeah, you can put, so from, for what concerns the, dy the, the, the dynamics, yes, you can put a force here and a force here. Yeah, to, to which have are periodic. Yeah. And uh, you are not adding any, of course, you're adding more in the, you know, for the physical point of view, but uh, for what mathematics is concerned, you don't add any difficulty. The difficulty here is basically because of this uh, uh, flow rate condition uh -huh. that you're putting on the problem. So yes, you can put some periodic force on the fluid, you can put periodic force on the body. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. the, the regularity that you need for that is exactly the regularity that you would get. Sorry if I'm scrolling this much. Mm -hmm. But usually it's any, okay. The regularity that you need is the same regularity that you would get from that which is a pretty standard. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Of course, this will be, you know, probably, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Yeah, okay. And what was the problem when you discuss about this Galerkin method and so on that you said that you, you don't, you need to... So this yeah, so basically, asking. so the, the, the problem that we have here is the fact that uh, we cannot use the usual, the usual method because of the energy that the energy uh, estimates that we have. We cannot use the usual method of uh, finding the, the, the usual ball in which your initial condition now is uh, repeated to find the, you know, to use, to use the classical fixed point argument for the construction mm -hmm. of periodic solution. So the, the way that we go is this involved the method. So first of all, because first of all, we are in infinite domain, right? At least in one direction, but we are in infinite mm -hmm. domain. So then what we do, we, I, as I said, we, mm -hmm. we, somehow defined, not we, def we, we, we proved that there exists a domain omega zero in which we know that the harmonic oscillator is always in there. And then we start enlarging uh, one unit at every step, this omega zero, so that eventually as M goes to infinity, I'm covering the whole channel. So now for each step M, this is the step M in which you are enlarging your domain omega zero one step, we solve using the Galerkin approximation. The way that we do the Galerkin approximation is through a, 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 a fixed point. So we linearize first the equation. Then we use a fixed point, Lere Schauder fixed point uh, theorem, uh, mm -hmm. fixed point theorem to show that there exists a periodic solution to the nonlinear problem. And then we pass to the limit first in N mm -hmm. and then in M. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, simply what you are doing is kind of this invading domain that you are on some fixed, uh, fixed domain and then you are passing to the limit. Yeah. But the pro main difficulty that, I mean, among all, uh, the main difficulty is to make sure that these it's bounds yeah. are independent of them. Hmm. Yeah. Which Great. somehow, if you don't have the, if you don't have the mass spring oscillator, it's easier because this is what Ladizenska has done. Mm -hmm. But of course, you don't have now information about the uh, the space asymptotics. Mm -hmm. But uh, as soon as you have it, because of the, some problems with the, with the pressure, uh, we we are not able to make all these bonds independent of them unless we assume the the, the flux to be small. Uh -huh. I see. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. One thing that I also didn't say, which I I I. I 
sorry, just a slightly mention is that we can show that this solution, if now the flux is more regular, they are also strong, but also we can also show the asymptotic behavior. Uh, we can show that this, not this U, this, the solution V, uh, in, uh, in sense of trace goes to zero at X, when mm -hmm. X1 goes to, uh, to, uh, to infinity, X1, remember, is the, the coordinate corresponding to the axis of, of, uh, um, uh, of, the, of the cylinder at each cross-section. So for every fixed cross-section, uh, when X1 goes to infinity, V goes to zero in the sense of you know, H1 half uh, norm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting that you're saying. Yeah, so please go ahead. So, <laughs> so I guess Tomas, please. Uh, yeah. So, so, so I just wonder uh, whether there is some connection with uh, um, some differential algebraic systems and uh, in the abstract form. Yeah? So this partial dissipative system. So I think this might be. This non dissipative part might be in the position of uh, so called volumetric constraints. Is it the, 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 uh, the this, uh, this kind of no, I mean, I, I, I didn't, I never looked at this in this, uh, in this, uh, in this way. No, so, I didn't. so, what is uh, so, what is uh, what was your idea? No, so for example, uh, what is here, uh, non dissipative is, uh, is the divergence free constraint. In, in fluid dynamics, in, in compressible uh -huh. dynamics. And then it is well known that uh, if, if you differentiate it twice, so then you can eliminate it. So mm -hmm. this is uh, what, uh, no, no, if you differentiate it once. Yeah? So so this is what is called uh, uh, differential algebraic systems index two. Yeah? Because, mm -hmm. so, so this two refers okay. uh, that you differentiate it once, if mm -hmm. you go to three, then you differentiate, must be differentiate twice to see so called underlying uh, system of uh, differential equation. No, no, I, 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 this is, this is new. I know, I know, that, no, uh, I didn't, I don't no, know. Maybe that. this Thank might you. be some another view. Yeah, this is very interesting. Yeah. So this, say it again, how, what how they are called, the uh, differential? Differential algebraic systems uh, or, or differential algebraic equations, D, I, uh, Mm -hmm. ah, okay, oh, I see. Okay. Here in the abstract form. Mm -hmm. So, for example, it's it's in the mechanical descriptor system. If you have some uh, some robotic arm, for example, so that, that there is some uh, geometry which uh, which uh, makes some constraints, and then there is some dynamic. Okay, thank you. That that's that's very interesting. I will look into it. Yeah, thank okay. you. But, but maybe it's not directly relevant. Yeah, no, this yeah, uh, this uh, whole story of, of uh, uh, partial dissipative system. system. I mean, the, the eventual goal would be to try to find a kind of uh, underlying structure for the or the, the just the, the abstract uh, problem. So, because I do see a certain kind of pattern. I mean, at least uh, for the application that I've been uh, uh, interested into. So, it would be really nice to to see uh, this kind of thing. So, thank you. This was uh, this was very useful. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I did something wrong. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so are there some any questions or remarks or suggestions and so on? This is not to be the case. So thank you very much. You see, it was thank you. Very, thank you for very nice. And I hope that you will come to Prague, uh, that we will see you not yeah, 2D, sure. but 3D. <laughs> yes, hopefully. Okay. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much. And thank you all for, for yeah, the Yeah, yeah, you were super anyway. Yeah, so thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. So hope to see you soon. Bye. 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 Oh. Bye bye, everyone. Very good. To bylo hezky. Jo, jo, docela zajímavý. To, to je jako zajímavý. Jsem o tom přemýšlela, o tom periodickém řešení, jak to tam máme. No jo, no to je. No ono, že jo, prostě tyhle ty oscilátory, když máš třeba dva, 
harmonický oscilátory na sobě, tak to nemusí být periodický, že jo? Tam může no. být tak, že jo? Tak to je to jako je to překvapivý, že by tam něco jako bylo periodický. A co je to, že, že teda i, i, že je to hezký model na to vnitřní jádro, to jsem si tak jako nikdy nějak vlastně neuvědomil. A jedna a jedna, která, že je to magnetodynamo, teďka jsem se koukal právě na nějaké články, ten Platzmeier, Roberts, mm-hmm. co je to mm-hmm. Takže opravdu, že je tam vlastně magnetodynamo i v tom vnitřním jádru. Mm-hmm. Ale je to jako zajímavý, no. A jinak v tom vnějším jádře, tam jako ten magnetodynamo efekt je, Spíš teda díky teplotnímu gradientu, jo. Mm. No, jasně, no, tak je to. A samozřejmě ten, že jo, ten Coriolis a středivá síla tam taky hrajou roli. A plus teda ještě teda rotace toho vnitřního jádra. Versus teda bášku. No ne, tak samozřejmě jako musíš, můžeš tam ještě narvat tu teplotu, no. No, ale te, já si myslím, že to je dost podstatný, víš, jo. To je možný. V tomhle ne? konkrétním případě, třeba u jiných planet nebo měsíců, je to jinak, jo? to já jako neříkám. Ale myslím, že u naší země, nevím, no, to by bylo dobré, kdyby prostě nějaký byl, kdyby to třeba dokumentovali, možná sám. No. Myslím, že třeba si jako, když se rozjedou nějaké procesy v plášti, že tam jsou takové ty blumy, že jo, a jednak tam, tam padají ty desky, že jo, dolů, a když se to tvoří, a jsou tam blumy, jo. A, a když se to víc rozjede, tak ono se to víc chladí. Jo? Vnitřňá, že? Když Jasně. se to zastaví, tak se to jakoby zahýzají. A to souvisí s přemagnetováním země. Mm-hmm. Takže tam ten teplotní gradient je dost podstatný. Jako. To je z toho tak, jako se to dovozí. V tom no, zemí, že? Jsou jiné planety, třeba Venuše, která vůbec nemá magnetodynamo, přestože, nebo skoro vůbec, přestože to má teplotní jádro. Tak to vlastně neví. No ne, je to, je to jako zajímavé, no, to ona dělá, no, to je se ne, Nevím, jak moc je to jako opravdu třidimenzionální, ale asi jo, nevím. No, no. Že mi to přijde někdy, že je to jako dvoudimenzionální. No, to jsou nějaký takový ty, to jsme dělali s tím, jak jsme s Bernárem, že vlastně u těch, u těch hvězdiček někdy máš jako tu třetí dimenzi malou, že jo. To je jasný, že se ti to tam jako smršťuje, ale furt ti tam jako by zůstává. Prostě co, u jaké hvězdiček? Jako u těch... Když máš prostě nějaký ty hvězdy ne? a děláš, no. děláš jako to proudění v těch hvězdách, tak tam se ti právě, můžeš tam ještě i narvat magnetický pole a všechno, ale prostě to, co se ti tam stane, je to, že vlastně ta jedna dimenze je malá. Jo? Že, že vlastně... Jako je malá. No ne, ty, když... když Počkej, že to je jako sférický, no můžeš to mít sféricky symetrický, tohle mluvíš. Ne, e, oso, takhle osově symetrický, osově. No, ale nejenom to, ty prostě, když máš, jak ono to tam je... Prostě je to, no, takový, jak se tomu říká, cylindrický souřadnice. No, to je no, jedé, vlastně, no. no nejenom to, ale když máš, když tam vlastně máš... Hmm, Máš, má, budeš mít rotaci a budeš tam mít ještě to Frodovo číslo a myslím, že tam musíš mít nějaký ten, ten rejt mezi nima. Já Takhle, já ti řeknu, máš prostě tři dimenze a jedna dimenze je malá, jo? Jako, představ si, že prostě v té jedné dimenzi to máš prostě nějaký jako lejet malý. Ne? A teď ještě máš sílu, a máš to tam parametrizovaný, jako prostě skalovaný tou froudovou silou. A dejme tomu, máš ten rate stejný, to, to, to froudovo číslo bude stejný jako, jako 0 epsilon té dimenze. Jo? Tak to, to číslo. No, tak to si ty můžeš dokázat, ty můžeš dokázat, že se ti jako ta hvězda jako smrštěje do dvou dimenzí. Jakoby. No? Jakože je to hrozně placatý. No. Jo, takhle. Aha, když se to jako rychle točí, tak je to takový disk, pak myslíš. No, jako takový disk, no. Ježiš, no, tak to se no. pak někdo vzoruje. To se, může, to se může právě dokázat, že to jako disk a může se, ale to, co se ti stane, je, že ti to, když máš tam nějakou tu self gravitaci, tak závisí to, jestli máš self gravitaci nebo celkou gravitaci, tak ona ti, já myslím, že u té celkové gravitace ti stejně ta jedna dimenze jakoby zůstane. 
U té gravitace prostě to musí být více méně kulový, že jo? No, u té self gravitace ne, ale u té... Počítanou energie jinak, že jo? No, u té u celkové gravitace, kterou máš vlastně... Na to musím pět. Tak to bych si dovedl představit jako nějaký globální model galaxie. To to no, tak... no, protože tam máš tu rotaci, máš tam tu... tu máš tam no, tu... přitom ta self gravitace tam není až tak dominantní, jo? protože je to vlastně řídký, že ty galaxie jsou řídký. Jo? Takže to, to by byl model na galaxie. Ale na hvězdy ne, ty hvězdy mají prostě... Tam ta self gravitace dominuje, když je hrozně velká. No tam máš, můžeš mít jedno nebo druhý. Můžeš mít tu self gravitaci nebo gravitaci nebo oboje. A, a čemu říkáš gravitace? No gravitace, Tačný, jako self gravitace máš, že máš jako, můžeš, že, že to vlastně máš jako potenciální sílu, která ti splňuje, no. že Laplace, Laplace to psí se v hustotě. Jo? No, Když tím. máš jako tu... No, jasně. Jo? A když máš tu jako tu vnější gravitaci, tak tu máš normálně klasickou, že je, tři, že je prostě v jednom směru, že jo? X3. No to může být lecce osno, ne? Tak to je zase taky, že jo? Prostě čeština, jak vyjadřuje, jak se ignorance českého národa, tak nerozlišuje gravity force a gravitational force. No, no dobře, no. Gravitational force je ta se gravitace a gravity force je, když tam ještě k tomu přičteš. Od středivou pílu, Coriolise a eventuálně ještě nějaký, ten, když se to zvykluje, tak no, je tam ta, No dobře, no, to středivou pílu tam tak ještě můžeš dát, ale nemůžeš. Jo, a, a, a tidal forces, jo. No a pak máš tě centrifugal force a ty blbiny, no. Jsem říkal, centrifugal no, force no, a Coriolise a, a ty slapový síly. No, no. To, to třeba, no, tak to máš právě, no, tak to tam právě blbneš těma 3D, 2D, ale tohle s tou teplotou to mě nenapadlo. No, to je tam, ty... speciálně u těch hvězd je to důležitý, protože, že jo, ta, ta hvězda, že jo, slunce má třeba vevnitř v té aktivní zóně, kde jsou termonukleální reakce, má asi 15 milionů stupňů. Jasně. To je prakticky studený. Jo, já to musím vypnout, já jsem zapomněla vypnout. 